What's up guys? So today is our first biochemistry lecture covering carbohydrates. But that doesn't mean that you can forget all the organic chemistry you just learned because biomolecules like carbohydrates are organic molecules. They're just really big ones. So let's get started with some definitions. So first of all, what is a carbohydrate? Well, everyone here has heard of carbohydrates because they're a very important part of our diets but they play a lot of other important biological roles as well and we're going to talk about some of those in this module and the nucleic acids module. So from a chemistry standpoint, a carbohydrate is a biomolecule consisting of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms, usually with the general formula CnH2On. So what that means is most carbohydrates are going to have a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio of carbon to hydrogen to oxygen. So let's see if I'm telling the truth here. So go ahead and pause this video and give me a molecular formula for this lactose molecule on the right here. So it looks like our lactose molecule has 12 carbons, 22 hydrogens, and 11 oxygens. So it's not quite a one to two to one ratio. For us to have a true one to two to one ratio, we would need C12H24O12. So it looks like we're missing two hydrogens and an oxygen. I wonder what two hydrogens and an oxygen could be used to form. So when we talk about biomolecules, especially carbohydrates, nucleic acids, and proteins, we use what we refer to as polymer notation. So a polymer is a large molecule composed of many repeating subunits. And these repeating subunits that we see over and over and over again that make up a polymer are referred to as monomers. So when you have two of these monomer subunits covalently linked together, that forms what we call a dimer. And if we have 3 to 10 of these attached together, that's what we call an oligomer. Now depending on who you ask, the definition for an oligomer might be 2 to 10 subunits or 3 to 10 subunits. Either of those answers are fine for this class. So how do we apply polymer notation to carbohydrates? So multiple carbohydrate monomers covalently linked, repeating over and over again. We refer to that as a polysaccharide. And these carbohydrate monomers, these repeating monomer subunits that make up a long chain carbohydrate are called monosaccharides or simple sugars. So given the definitions on the previous slide and the ones we just went over on this slide, go ahead and pause this video and see if you can tell me what you would call a carbohydrate dimer and what you would call a carbohydrate oligomer. So as you might have guessed, a carbohydrate dimer is a disaccharide and a carbohydrate oligomer would be an oligosaccharide. So you're not going to have to name individual carbohydrates like you had to do with all the organic molecules in the last two modules. So instead, we're going to classify monosaccharides by functional group and by size. So unless some kind of reaction has occurred, every carbohydrate has at least two alcohol groups. So we refer to carbohydrates as polyhydroxy compounds and they all have a second functional group as well, either an aldehyde or a ketone. A carbohydrate with an aldehyde is referred to as an aldose, and a carbohydrate with a ketone is referred to as a ketose. And like we mentioned earlier, since these are polyhydroxy compounds, usually every other carbon on the carbohydrate is going to carry an OH group. So how do we classify monosaccharides by size? We're going to classify them based on the number of carbon atoms they contain. So a carbohydrate with three carbon atoms is going to be a triose. A carbohydrate with four carbon atoms is going to be a tetrose. A carbohydrate with five carbon atoms is going to be a pentose. And go ahead and pause this video and see if you can tell me what you think you would call a six carbon carbohydrate and a seven carbon carbohydrate. That's right, a six carbon carbohydrate would be a hexose and a seven carbon would be a heptose. 
So here's how we put it all together. So here's how we describe a carbohydrate based on both its functional group and its number of carbons. So we're going to use the functional group as a prefix. So either aldo or keto. And then we're going to follow it with its size. So triose, tetros, pentose, hexose, or heptose. So let's try an example. So go ahead and pause this video and see if you can come up with a classification for this monosaccharide based on its functional group and number of carbon atoms. Okay, let's see what you came up with. So it looks like our functional group is an aldehyde and we have three carbon atoms. So this molecule would be a aldotriose. Okay, let's try a couple more examples. So go ahead and pause this video and see if you can classify both of these sugars based on functional group and number of carbon atoms. Okay, let's start with the one on the left. So this has a ketone functional group and it looks like we have five carbon atoms. So this sugar would be a keto pentose. Okay, how about this one on the right? So this one has an aldehyde functional group, and it looks like we have seven carbon atoms. So this would be an aldoheptose. So stereoisomers are very important when we're talking about carbohydrates. So in case you forgot from our first module, stereoisomers are molecules with the same molecular formula, same atomic connections, but different three-dimensional shapes. And stereoisomers can only be interchanged from one to the other by the breaking of bonds. So go ahead and pause this video and see if you can tell me what subset of stereoisomers have we already covered so far this semester. So the only type of stereoisomer we have talked about so far is geometric isomers. So our next type of stereoisomer for this class is the enantiomer. Enantiomers are stereoisomers that are non-superimposable mirror images. So what I want you to do now is pull out your molecular model kit, and I want you to build the following molecule. I want you to grab a carbon atom, and I want you to attach it to four different other atoms. So for my example, I'm going to use a hydrogen, a bromine, a chlorine, and a fluorine. So here's what mine look like. Okay, so now what I want you to do, remove any two atoms from your molecule and swap their places. So for me, I'm going to swap my hydrogen and my bromine. So now my molecule looks like this. So what you've created here, what I've created, is a pair of enantiomers. So these are stereoisomers. They have the same molecular formulas. They have the same atomic connections, but their 3D shape is different, and they can only be interchanged by breaking bonds, which is what you just did with your kit. So there's no way that you can make these two molecules look identical without breaking the bonds. So they're not superimposable but you can line them up next to each other where it appears like one molecule is the reflection of the other molecule. And that's what makes them in antiomers. So that brings us to chirality. So chirality is just a term used to describe objects like this, objects that cannot be superimposed on their mirror images. So these two molecules that you built, the two molecules that I built, these are chiral molecules and they're said to have a chiral center. And for the purposes of our class, we're talking about that carbon atom in the middle. So for a carbon atom to be a chiral center, it has to be attached to four different atoms or groups of atoms. And when you're drawing a structure and I want you to identify a chiral center, you're going to mark that carbon atom with an asterisk. Okay, so let's try a few examples. So let's go ahead and start with this example in the top left. So go ahead and pause your video and see if you can identify any chiral centers in this molecule. 
Okay, let's look at this one carbon at a time. So let's start with carbon one here. So carbon one is bound to three hydrogens and a whole mess of stuff to the right. So carbon one cannot be a chiral carbon because a chiral carbon has to have four different atoms or different groups of atoms attached to it. And since we have three of the same atom, this cannot be a chiral center. Okay, what about carbon number two? So same thing here, carbon number two is bound to two hydrogens. So since it's bound to two of the same atom, it cannot be a chiral carbon. And we can say the same thing for carbons four, five, six, and seven. They're all bound to multiple hydrogens, so they cannot be chiral centers. So that just leaves carbon number three. So is carbon number three a chiral carbon? We have a methyl group going down. We have a two carbon group going to the left. So remember, it's not just the immediate atom attached, it's the group of atoms attached. So we have an ethyl group going to the left and a three carbon group, so a propyl group going to the right. So we have four different groups attached to this carbon atom. So this carbon atom is chiral. Okay, so let's try the one in the top right now. So if you hadn't tried this one yet, go ahead and pause your video and see if you can identify every chiral carbon in structure B at the top right. Okay, so let's make this easy for us. So any carbon that has multiple hydrogens attached to it, we can go ahead and eliminate because by definition, there has to be four different groups of atoms or atoms attached to a chiral carbon. So that means carbons one, three, four, six, seven, eight, and nine are all not options. So that just leaves carbons two and carbons five. So let's look at carbon two. So carbon two has an OH going up, a methyl group to the left, a methyl group going down, and a whole mess of stuff to the right. So since we have two methyl groups attached to this carbon, it cannot be chiral. So what about carbon five? So carbon five has a hydroxy group going up, a methyl group to the right, an ethyl group going down, and a whole mess of stuff to the left. So that's four different groups coming off of that carbon atom, so that carbon atom is a chiral center. Okay, let's try the last one, the one at the bottom. So just like before, let's go ahead and eliminate any carbons that have multiple hydrogens attached to them. So we can go ahead and get rid of carbons one, three, and six. So that leaves carbons two, four, and five, as possible chiral centers. So let's look at carbon two. So carbon two, we have a bromine going up, a methyl group to the left, a hydrogen going down, and a whole mess of stuff to the right. So carbon two is definitely a chiral center. Okay, let's work on carbon four. So carbon four has a bromine going down, a mess of stuff going to the left, a hydrogen going up, and a mess of stuff going to the right. But are our messes to the left and our messes to the right the same? And just a quick look at the structure tells us no, the mess of atoms on the right contains a carbonyl, but no bromine, whereas the mess on the left has two bromines, but no carbonyls. So those are four distinctly different groups, so that means carbon four is also a chiral center. Okay, what about carbon five? So carbon five, we have a double bonded oxygen going up, a methyl group to the right, and a whole mess of stuff to the left. So is this a chiral center? Well, they're all different groups, but we only have three different groups. So by definition, we have to have four different atoms or groups of atoms. So since we don't have four connections, period, this cannot be a chiral carbon. So that means this molecule at the bottom has two chiral carbons at carbons two and carbon four. So as you notice from the last slide, it is possible to have more than one chiral center 
in a molecule. And in fact, most carbohydrates have multiple chiral centers. So a single chiral carbon is going to produce a pair of stereoisomers. But how many stereoisomers can be formed if a molecule has more than one chiral carbon? So luckily there's a pretty easy formula we can use to determine that. So the maximum number of stereoisomers possible for a molecule is 2 to the n, where n is the number of chiral carbons. So let's try an example with this. So go ahead and pause this video and draw out a structure for 2-bromo-3-chlorobutane. Identify all the chiral centers and tell me how many stereoisomers are possible for that molecule. Okay, so 2 bromo 3 chlorobutane so butane is our parent chain, with a bromine at position 2 and a chlorine at position 3. So this molecule has two chiral centers, carbons 2 and carbon 3. So the maximum number of stereoisomers for this molecule is 2 to the second power equals 4 possible stereoisomers. Okay, one last example before we wrap up today. Okay, so here are all four possible stereoisomers with the name 2-bromo-3-chlorobutane. So molecule A and molecule B are in antimers. These are non-superimposable mirror images. Same thing for C and D. Those are also a pair of enantiomers. So how do we describe a pair of molecules that are stereoisomers but are not mirror images? There's no way you can line them up where they're identical, and there's no way you can line them up where one is a reflection of the other. So is there a term we can use to describe A and C or B and D? Well, there is. That term is diastereomer. So a diastereomer is a pair of stereoisomers that are not mirror images.